you to our uh, fourth and final symposium of the year uh, that is focused on how we look at uh, energy, uh, the big push in artificial intelligence, automation, robotics, and specifically looking at the issue of how this would affect people in energy. So first of all, welcome. Uh, we greatly appreciate you being here. I want to take a minute to thank our sponsors, um, our media sponsors, Fuel Fix, uh, and the Houston Chronicle, and the Houston Public Media. Uh, these are the people who are the, uh, videotaping this, uh, this uh, entire episode, and uh, they really do a bang up job in terms of looking at, at uh, producing our videos um, in, uh, for, for the symposium. I want to thank our Energy Advisory Board. I see at least one member of it here um, for their advice and their input in driving the symposium. Uh, and uh, they have been collectively uh, the, uh, the drivers behind the intellectual growth of uh, UH Energy and the Energy Initiative at the university. Um, we have uh, a set of outstanding fellows at the university. This is our third group of fellows uh, that are of, of selected from our faculty. They are truly thought leaders. Uh, they post uh, frequently on our Forbes.com blog. And if you've not read those or if you're not registered to receive those updates, please do. These are really thought-provoking blogs uh, that we get from them. So we've got about 30 of them now uh, over the last three years. And we're certainly looking for uh, increasing their numbers and sort of growing our new a batch of uh, uh, fellows, and so if you've got ideas, nominations, we certainly would love to hear from you. Much of the production today is courtesy of our fantastic volunteers, uh, student volunteers from the Energy Coalition. Uh, the Energy Coalition, as David Reed knows, uh, is perhaps the largest uh, student organization anywhere in the country that's focused on energy. These are outstanding individuals that do uh, an amazing job to promote energy on campus and coalesce all activities on energy. We know it's a beautiful sunny day. This is unusual for a UH energy event. Usually it's raining. Uh, and so if, you, if uh, somebody didn't make it here or if you've got friends and relatives out there who would love to hear more about this, we've streamed this face on Facebook Live. Uh, certainly no information is being collected about you uh, through, through at least through our apparatus. <laughs> so I want to assure you of that part of it. But if you choose to and want to look at it later on, it's certainly also available on Facebook. Uh, do connect with us on social media. Uh, we are certainly very appreciative of uh, you connecting with us. We've got a few energy, UH energy related announcements and these are really targeted at our students. And I want to sort of highlight uh, a video competition uh, that we've got uh, that is ongoing. Uh, so I think there is a short video on that. Uh, Shannon, is that right? Okay, no, there is no short video, but if the student's here uh, and you produce a 90 second long video that, uh, that will be on a topic in energy that is produced with either animation, stop motion, just plain old vanilla video, um, we appreciate all of that. We are trying to uh, develop a partnership with the Houston Museum of Natural Sciences and possibly have this shown, uh, the winning ones uh, shown there. This is a work in progress, uh, but certainly we are looking for something really high profile there. We also do have a movie screening um, on the 28th of March, a week from today, uh, uh, sorry, next Tuesday, uh, that is on, um, uh, that is on, called The Happening. It's a clean energy revolution a video, a movie uh, that we certainly want you to, if, you're, if you can come and join us, do come and join us. There's also a panel discussion that follows that. So we're going to have this be interactive with you. And so one of the things that we're going to do with you right now is get you to um, participate in a few minutes on a quiz uh, that uh, is on today's topic. You do that, you get the right answers, and you do it fast, and you could win yourself a drone. To something that can compete with Mickey's drone here and, uh, uh, and something that you, you'll be pretty proud to have. So uh, watch out for that. It's going to be interactive. You can use your smartphone to do this. It's a fun thing to get you involved. Uh, and I'm sure uh, the, the students are going to be here and they're probably going to win uh, some of these things. So um, one other thing that we do ask you to use your phones to do or your interactive devices is to ask your questions of the panel. Uh, you, can, you can certainly uh, put your questions through on that website. It's a fairly straightforward way to go and do it. Uh, and we'll be able to uh, then uh, select questions from that and target 
uh, the, the, uh, the targeted to for our panel here. So very quickly, want to give you the boundaries of what we're trying to talk about here. Uh, and I have maybe three, four minutes of uh, an overview on the topic that I think will interest you in, and put some context to what our speakers are going to talk about. So as you probably recognize, energy is the focus uh, of, for what we do here. And the reason we have targeted that is because, uh, and, the, and the issue with robotics is because energy demand is not going down. It's going to probably go up. Um, the IEA uh, uh, last year estimated that there is going to be a 28% increase in energy demand globally over the next 25 years, uh, going from about 575 quadrillion BTU to 736 quadrillion BTU. This doesn't, this is agnostic to source. It is just the hard number of the amount of energy we as humanity are going to need. Oil and gas is going to play a prominent role in this, as will renewables like wind and solar. But all the easy energy is done. We're not going to find easy energy. It's going to be hard. It's going to be in places that, are, uh, uh, that have got harsh climates. They're going to be hard to recover. Uh, and, uh, and, the, and as you know, um, the oil and gas industry, as is the rest of the energy industry, stuck in a paradigm where lower for longer is going to be the mantra. If in that, uh, under those conditions, cost reductions is going to be a dominant player for why uh, we, we were looking to see alternate ways to, to produce and distribute energy. Clearly, one other aspect, and this really comes back to social license to operate for the energy industry, is whatever we do, it has to be done safely, reliably, and environmentally sustainably. And all of these are significant requirements that are going to prove to be a challenge for the industry. So the, 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 the big push has been from the issue of artificial intelligence and robotics as being the driver for change in the energy industry. Uh, from a, so we can all get into definitions of artificial intelligence, uh, machine learning, uh, topics like that. I'm, I'm certainly not an expert in this, but I'm going to give you a different perspective on where we think this is going to be important. And from a business need perspective, artificial intelligence and, and the automation uh, plays a role because it can, it can make processes automatic, efficient, uh, and uh, reliable. The second is that you can use big data to provide insights into how your uh, uh, and using data analytics, data-driven science, to really provide insights into your business. And the third one is really engaging with customers and employees, whether it is for hurricane resilience or for really understanding needs and demands. And so those are the key drivers, if you will, for why AI and automation have really caught on. The key enablers here have been robotics and process automation, cognitive insight through machine learning, deep learning, and the rest of those. And lastly, cognitive engagement through virtual reality and augmented reality. These are sort of the drivers for where, uh, where the industry wants to bring in automation uh, and ro robotics. A survey carried out uh, uh, recently and published in the, uh, in the Harvard Business Review uh, identified contrary to what most people's expectations are, that, and you will see this on the last bar there, reducing workforce is perhaps the lowest priority for most executives when they are thinking about automation and robotics. And so really, the, the, while the focus has been that we're going to lose jobs, that we're going to lose the kinds of skills that we need to develop and grow, it is unlikely that that is the driver and the, and the consequence of, what, of uh, this automation and artificial intelligence revolution. So many of us, um, people of my age and perhaps a little bit older, think it's all hype. Okay? And so let me very quickly give you the notion that this is perhaps not our first rodeo. We've been around the block a few times uh, and failed a bunch of times. And, so, and why today is different. So the idea of a robot was first identified in 1921 uh, by a Czech writer 
uh, Carol Chapek, uh, and that was the first notion of a robot. Um, I'm sure you've all read Isaac Asimov's classic books. In 1941, he identified the three law laws of robotics, much like the three laws of motion. Uh, and these basically said, you cannot, uh, the robots cannot injure humans, um, a robot must obey orders, and uh, a robot must protect itself, as long as it doesn't violate rules one and two. Okay, which was that it can't harm humans and it, can't, uh, and it must follow orders. So that's the fundamental basis of where people have come out with robotics. Um, and much of the consternation that happened with 2001 Space Odyssey was the machine went against, the, against man. So the first notion of artificial intelligence and characterized as such happened in the 1950s. Alan Turing with the Turing Law uh, of how you measure intelligence or how do you know when a computer is intelligent defined AI. Um, and in 1956, there was a conference held at Dartmouth College when the first time the AI idea of artificial intelligence was used. A lot of hype was built between 1956 and 1970 when uh, at the end of 19, in the early 70s, uh, there was a huge slash in funding for uh, R&D in artificial intelligence, and it's called the first artificial intelligence winter that happened. That went on till about 1981 when expert systems were created, and there was a huge resurgence in artificial intelligence. By the late 1980s, we had run through that, that cycle of, uh, of expert systems, and we, we started the second uh, AI winter, uh, and essentially, everybody lost interest until 1997, when IBM created uh, the, the Deep Blue machine that beat the then uh, world champion in chess, Gary Kasparov. And that, perhaps, has been the defining point where, where AI and uh, the automation revolution has changed. Today, there have been three things that have happened that suggest that this is probably not hype. First, you've got a confluence of computer power that has been unprecedented, the growth in computing power. The second, we've got data, more data than we know what to do with uh, that, and we don't know how to process. And this idea that you've got internet of things all over the place that gives you data uh, that is uh, really uh, provided the engine, the, the fuel for the engine uh, is sort of the, the new thing that's happened. And the third thing that has really transformed has been the whole science of machine learning and cognition. So uh, overall, it, this is a place where we think that this is probably not gonna be hype. It's not gonna be hype because of these reasons. There's a whole bunch of other reasons where people think uh, that it might fail. This current wave of AI might fail. But the overhyping is perhaps the lowest uh, 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 notion for why this revolution will fail. Uh, so one last slide that, that capture my thoughts on where this goes in terms of impact on people. We've got to think about, so everything that I've told you up to now is about what we call as narrow AI, or very focused AI. We think the whole notion is going to really target itself with what is called as general AI. And this is the fear and hope that people have. General AI is a notional system where the intelligent behavior of a computer or a machine is at least as advanced as uh, across many different cognitive skills as a person would be. So you couldn't tell the difference between a man or a machine. This is called the intelligence explosion. Most experts in the field believe this is many decades away. Um, but there's a significant contrarian in this place, and that's Elon Musk, who has come out and explicitly said in the next five years, you're going to get this intelligence explosion that is going to transform the world and beware what you're getting into. And that really raises many of the challenges that we have with humans and, uh, and all that we've spoken here. Questions of automation versus human machine teaming. Um, questions about ethics, regulation, safety, and cyber resilience. That is perhaps the one big issue that still keeps people awake. And the issue of standardization. As it relates to workforce, I think there are three big issues that you're gonna see. Um, development of the workforce, of the right workforce, 
And in this, I'm going to ask a sort of a, a provocative question that I think uh, people in education are thinking about. Should we make computer science a necessary skill for students going through K through 12? In addition to the three R's, you do three R's and one C. Okay, uh, and so, um, so that's being asked of people. That's gonna be something that I think we're all gonna think about pretty hard. Second is truly diversity of the workforce. Uh, it is astounding that today in 2017, we have fewer women in computer science than we had in 1984. Just stupefying, but that's where we are today. Um, and so, but does this mean gloom and doom? Um, I will submit to you that this is not gloom and doom, and this is a chart here you will see about how employment has changed since 1850 to 2015 in the United States. The employment, overall employment, has continued to grow, but the fields of employment have changed. Agriculture has lost 56% of, pe of people who used to work in 1850 to today. Manufacturing, we're starting to see a decline. We start, we've certainly seen a decline in mining, but there are all these new fields where uh, you've seen a huge increase in people. So with that uh, as sort of background, I'm going to um, tell you we've got four amazing speakers here um, who, are, who represent uh, the best uh, of the people in uh, bringing this revolution of artificial intelligence, robotics, automation uh, to, to various aspects of the industry. We've got Rashid Haq, um, who is the global head of AI, robotics, and data engineering from at Sapien Consulting. Um, he's, um, had, uh, he's done his degrees from University of Rochester and the University of Oregon. Uh, Michael Frisch, um, uh, who uh, manager of industrial sensors at the Physical Sciences Institute, uh, Incorporated. He has done pioneering work in looking at methane gas uh, leakage uh, and studied at uh, Cornell University. Um, Julia Badger, who is um, a project manager at NASA JSC. Uh, she studied at Purdue uh, and at Caltech and is considered uh, by her colleagues at NASA to be really the true pioneer of bringing robotics to uh, NASA and uh, to space flight. And lastly, uh, David Reed, that many of our students know, but perhaps um, people in the audience don't necessarily know, but you can certainly read his background. Um, he is the chief marketing officer at NOV, um, and uh, his background is really spectacular. He's a construction um, a management and design graduate from Northumbria College in, in over across the pond, uh, and uh, really uh, a remarkable individual. We'll get to talk to them in a few minutes, but before we go there, we're gonna do something here that is interesting. You can all take out your phones. We're gonna do a quiz. The person who wins this, and I, as I mentioned, the person who wins it needs to be accurate and fast, and you've got to speed count. So five questions will be done in uh, two and a half minutes, but it gets you started. You've got to type in kahoot.com. I hope they can get that information up. So, um, K-A-H-O-O-T dot com. And we will get you a pin code. It'll ask you to play and you need a pin code. Okay, the pin code is 1056916. So hopefully you can get that. 1056916. It's almost back there. There. Yes. So we've got 65 players on already. Um, the panelists can play too if they want to. <laughs> so, these, are, these are hard questions. So, so actually, the first quiz is actually easier than the second one. So, so, just, um, so the code is 1056916, and you win a drone. Um, as a first prize, so should we get started? Not yet, okay. Still getting people on. Yep, it automatically forwards to that, so. so, so. 
Okay, so let's get started with the quiz. So, okay, start. There you go. Okay, five questions. Multiple choice, so you don't have to guess anything. So, thousand points per question. So in 2014, Google acquired Nest Labs, the maker of high-tech thermostats and smoke detectors for, four answers, 121 million, 547 million, 3.2 billion, or 14.3 billion. Just to remind you, the Nest, um, when they went up on Shark Tank, nobody bought, nobody, uh, bought the idea. So, um, so they went up on Shark Tank, uh, nobody uh, took that on. So four seconds left. Okay, so the right answer was 3.2 billion. We got quite a few people who got that right. So, um, so let's go on to the next question. Shark Tank really lost art. So, uh, next. Up oh, next. Okay. There you go. Uh. Ah. <laughs> It's hard, guys. <laughs> okay, question two. Oops. Uh -oh. We don't. We got no, a problem here. Okay. So. It's 2013. I don't think we got to see the question. So. Um, Got to be really quick. Quick. I don't know what the deal is. Okay. Recently, Harvard Business Review surveyed 250 industry executives about their goal for the use of AI. What percentage of them indicated that reducing headcount was their primary goal? 90, 22, 67, and 11. 12 seconds. All right. Okay, so we got uh, 22 was the right answer. So you guys weren't paying attention to my slides. <laughs> okay, four, question four. So according to the National Science and Technology Council subcommittee report in 2016, what percentage of jobs that pay under $20 an hour will most likely be automated in the next few years? 5%, 17%, 34%, or 83%? Let's see how many of you are optimists here. So the right answer was actually 83%. So it's remarkable that the low paying jobs are going to be eliminated in short order. So, and the last question for this, for this part of the quiz. Um, According to IHS market, by the year 2030, the number of connected IoT devices worldwide would be 10 million, 1 billion, 125 billion, or 3.7 trillion. Great, it's, it was actually 125 billion. So today we have close to uh, 15 billion devices. So, um, so, so with that, LS is the winner. Uh, we got, uh, so uh, getting all four, four questions right. So at the end of this, uh, please uh, come by and identify yourself and we'll be happy to uh, give you a drone. So uh, thank you so much for playing. Uh, so without further ado, I'm gonna now get started with uh, my colleagues here. Uh, uh, and the first person who's gonna come up and speak is uh, Rashid Haq. Uh, Rashid is, uh, as I mentioned, he is the global head of AI robotics and data engineering at Sapient Consulting. Um, he, one of the coolest things about him that is not on the bio sketch that you have is he is one of the inventors of quantum cloaking. So I'm hoping that you will ask him what that is uh, in, in the Q&A. Uh, but it, it's certainly a very exciting technology. Uh, this, as, as Rashid will tell you, this is something that is probably going to win the Nobel Prize uh, in short order. But um, and he's probably a contender for it. So Rashid. Uh,
Thank you. And let me get the clicker here. There we go. So I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about uh, some of the ways that AI and robotics are being used within the energy industry. And these are uh, somewhat similar to how they're being used in other industries as, a, as well. And uh, then I'm going to talk uh, very briefly about how that's uh, affecting or potentially going to affect uh, people and, uh, and jobs and so forth. So I'll start with uh, this one. The first example that I have is in uh, oil exploration. So today, the way this uh, works is today, meaning maybe it's yesterday. Uh, highly skilled people are uh, manually uh, connecting these pipes that you can see on the left side uh, down through the well so that they can uh, drill through the crust and uh, extract the oil and gas uh, to, to bring that out. And this is, a, in general, a dangerous uh, job, and it's also in a fairly harsh environment. And the uh, profession hasn't changed dramatically uh, over the last uh, 10 years or so, even though the safety of this environment has been uh, continuously improving over this time frame. Right? And uh, what's happening now is that these uh, high precision uh, intelligent robots are starting to be deployed uh, to automate some of these tasks so that you can uh, reduce risk for the employees, right? And these robots, there's a picture on the, on the right side. Those are uh, things that can uh, take those pipes, maneuver it uh, uh, fairly easily with the right, and position it in the right place with the right amount of torque. And the precision for these things is uh, uh, very uh, high, right? So you can, like, they have a millimeter level precision out of uh, 10 feet, right? That's uh, one part in about 10,000. So all of that is helping uh, the, the safety situation. A very different example in this second one is a virtual assistant being uh, used in uh, this example at Shell for uh, lubricants. And this is a situation where uh, it's being used for business-to-business -business wholesale uh, sales. And normally, uh, people would go to the website, people who are trying to buy lubricants in bulk for either distribution or uh, for uh, other uses for, for their company. They're, they would have to go to the website, and they would uh, go through a query against a large database and figure out what's where and how to get these uh, products. And if, um, you know, eventually they would uh, get frustrated, call a, call a sales representative on the phone, and then work out the rest of the uh, process, right? Not, not I'm just talking gener generically, not necessarily this specific example. And with the virtual assistant, now they can uh, talk in natural language uh, with this uh, bot, uh, ask their questions, explain what they need, and they don't have to understand the uh, database structure and queries and things like that. And the bot will respond uh, with their bot's recommendation in terms of what would best fit this uh, customer. So it's making this uh, process much smoother in general. Uh, let me go to a third example here, where uh, you know, in this is about uh, shipping uh, for oil trading, uh, oil and uh, crude and refined products. And in this example, so in the uh, 1990s and 2000s, a lot of the uh, paperwork that's around ships uh, got digitized. So these are things like bill, bills of lading, uh, inspection reports, and so forth. They got written down uh, electronically, and now you can start looking, looking up based on GPS and other information where every ship is, where every ship is in the world today, and uh, based on these electronic records, also what's on the ship. And uh, one large 
oil trading company wanted to take that a little bit further and not just understand where the ships are now, but uh, what's on it and where is it going to be uh, each day for the next 30 days, so be able to predict it. And <clears throat> what they did is they took seven years of uh, historical data, so about uh, 100 million uh, shipping movements, and ran that through a, a machine learning algorithm to figure out, uh, to create a model that can figure out uh, where ships are going to be. So every day you can tell it where a given ship is and it will tell you uh, for each of the next 30 days or 60 days where it's uh, going to be with a precision of, uh, or accuracy of more than 90%. And you can imagine that knowing that information, not just about their ships, but about every ship in the world, including their competitors, gives them a huge uh, information advantage in terms of uh, what they should do with their supply chain, what they should do in terms of where to uh, charter their ships, uh, where to position their commodities and, and so forth. So each of these uh, examples uh, then has uh, different types of uh, implications, right? So we, we, in these examples, we talked about things that are completely replacing what a human might be doing, things that are augmenting what humans are doing and in improving their productivity, and things that uh, humans were not doing at all because it was impossible for humans to do, and now they're, uh, but the AI is uh, helping do these types of activities. And in terms of implications for humans, uh, one aspect is, uh, things like the improved safety uh, and improved uh, possibilities of uh, new things like that uh, predicting where ships are going to be and also improved accuracy which becomes important in some cases most dramatically in uh, medical diagnosis. Right? So all of those have uh, huge human implications. And then the other side of it is also uh, there's a lot of discussion about uh, what it's going to do uh, to the job, jobs and jobs market. So I want to talk a little bit about that as well. So on, on this picture, you can see most jobs are uh, based on some set of skills. And each of these skills are going to go through their own life cycle. Right? It's going, often the skills start as uh, highly specialized, uh, highly specialized skills, and uh, they start to evolve as more and more education happens around that. As uh, incremental tools uh, are built to help support that, it starts to become uh, easier to do, and more of the junior staff start to do the work. And then eventually it uh, get, gets to a point where uh, the skill starts to become commoditized. It's not a big uh, differentiator for each of these companies. So then they go through uh, uh, outsourcing or uh, offshoring process. Right? And beyond that, it can also at some point either get automated through technology or it may be something that becomes uh, unnecessary because things around them changed. And what's uh, happening with AI and robotics, and we can see the very early stages of this, is that it's affecting both ends of that uh, life cycle in slightly different ways. So you can see that uh, on the one hand, uh, the uh, automation and so forth are making uh, some jobs uh, unnecessary or uh, like the job itself becomes unnecessary or it's being handled through AI and robotics, right? And the, the metric that Ramanan just showed uh, shows some of that example, right? And, and this is, you can think of the analogy, this happens with almost every new te uh, technology that gets released. So when you look at cars, when in the 1920s uh, more and more people started to drive, people who were driving the horse carriages uh, started to lose their jobs to automation, but the people who were cleaning the streets of horse dung, their jobs were not automated, but the uh, task itself was no longer required because there weren't enough horses on the street. 
So, th so that's uh, one side of the spectrum. And then on the other side, uh, we're already seeing massive demand for new skill sets around robotics, robotic process automation, machine learning, uh, cognitive computing, and data science, and so forth. I, the, I recently saw a metric that in the US alone, there are uh, 400,000 uh, open uh, job positions for data science and machine learning that are uh, not getting filled because there's not enough supply. So you can start to see uh, that growing, which is sort of like the car factories. And it's not, when you think about the car factories, the manufacturing factories, they certainly employed a lot of uh, people, but other things also grew up around that. Right? The people bu building the roads, the people working at the gas stations, motor hotels or motels that uh, popped up, uh, lots of small businesses, uh, the maintenance and so maintenance of cars, all those kinds of things grew up uh, creating jobs uh, around the uh, car industry. And we'll see that kind of shift happening. And historically, every, every time, almost every time that this has happened that's been studied, uh, the jobs created on the left side of this have been a uh, higher number than the jobs on the lost on the right side of this. Uh, but there's also been some additional things that are supporting that process, so things that, uh, that are coming from reasonable regulation. And one of the big ones was in 1938, the uh, Fair Labor Standards Act, which uh, mandated uh, the 40 work, uh, 40 hour work week, which gave us uh, for, for the first time a two day weekend instead of a one day weekend. And I think that uh, with productivity gains, that kind of uh, sort of reasonable regulations uh, may also be needed in this case. Right? And so I'll conclude with my prediction that by 2030, we're going to have the uh, three day weekend. Thank you. is a project manager at NASA JSC. Uh, and the story she's going to tell you today about what they've been doing is spectacular, not just because of how they're transforming space travel, but how they're changing the energy industry with what they're doing. So that, Julia. Thank you. So um, you guys might be wondering why a space person is here at an energy forum talking about um, energy topics. And so my title is trying to make sure that I convince you that at least by the end of this talk that we should have some sense of, of why I'm here. So energy, artificial intelligence, and robotics um, is also very important for the future of people in space. I'll focus mostly on the artificial intelligence and robotics, but energy is also very much there. But I want you to... Um, kind of get from the talk that while our applications might be different in the space industry, our problems are very much the same. So what is the future of people in space? So um, we've been given, NASA's been given um, the charter to go and promote sustained human presence in deep space. Um, so we have lots of different operations concepts that we're talking about to do that. The most popular one that seems to be supported by the president's budget is to um, have a lunar outpost of some sort. And so we have a picture here of a habitat that we will be sending to um, a lunar orbit. So it's uh, an orbit around the moon. Um, it's going to be a, something called the lunar, lunar orbital platform slash gateway. And the reason that we nicknamed it and call it Gateway, is because it's supposed to be a gateway to further out, so either going to Mars, to the moon's surface, what have you. And this outpost is meant to be um, a place where astronauts can come and do work, to visit, to be able to develop the, the vehicle that goes to Mars, to practice the types of technologies that we're going to need when we go to Mars. And so the idea is to make it more autonomous, to make it so that we don't talk to it as much as we talk to the International Space Station and do those sorts of things. One way of doing that is we're going to send our stuff, send our habitat, 
first. And then we're going to send people one to three years later. And then we're going to have them stay for only 30 to 60 days and then leave the habitat for 10 months. So if you've ever left your house on vacation for like a month and you get back and you're like, holy cow, why is all this stuff broken or what have you? We're kind of expecting the same thing when we do this to our habitat because that's just life. We see that on the International Space Station. The astronauts spend a decent amount of time doing both preventive and corrective maintenance. And we expect that while our platforms, our, our habitats, whether they're in lunar orbit or on Mars, aren't inhabited, we're going to have the same sorts of needs. We're going to need the system to be smart enough to take care of itself and to maintain itself and even repair itself when needed. So that brings me to my work. So one of the, the things that I'm um, a project manager of is a robot called Robonaut. It's a humanoid, upper body humanoid, that's meant to do caretaking of human spaces and assistance to astronauts. So it is um, able to access the same sorts of tools and interfaces as humans do with human-like force, but yet be safe to be used around humans. So this video here is uh, probably four or five years old. It's of the one that we have on the International Space Station. And we're using it as a test bed to try to develop the technologies that we will need when we have these uninhabited periods for our future deep space exploration missions. So in this one, um, Robonaut is uh, dealing with some soft goods. The soft goods are important because all of our outside assets, all of the things, the avionics boxes or the orbital replacement units that are outside the space station are covered with these types of thermal blankets. So to access them, the astronauts have to take off the blankets to then be able to do maintenance. So showing that the robot can do this was a big deal. Only we did this, you know, we were commanding the robot on the ground and the robot's on orbit. We can, we can kind of see through its eyes in this one little um, view that we had here. And situational awareness is just terrible. We found that the way we were doing things was not good enough to make an efficient um, extension or avatar of ourselves, and it wasn't an efficient replacement for the crew. So we dedicated the, la the last five years or so of um, my group's um, work to trying to make that better. So here is also sort of an old demonstration, but we, um, this was three years ago, and we took this um, from the first demo that we showed you that we did on the International Space Station. This is another Romanaut. We added legs. They're very creepy, not humanoid, so we can still say upper body humanoid. But the idea here is that um, it's in a gravity offload facility at Johnson Space Center, um, just down the road, and it is trying to do a little bit more um, autonomy. So we've been developing tools so that we could get the robot to climb across the station on its own. We're using path planning algorithms, autonomous grasping of the handrails here. So it's got the cameras in the, the feet, if you will, so that it can understand where it is in, in reference to these handrails. And then it's going to access several tools. And the task that we're doing here is meant to be like collecting um, a toolkit for astronauts to use um, later on that day. But you could imagine this being finding any logistics uh, um, item that you need, putting away items, or even doing a quick repair on uh, repair replace on an, an, a faulty avionics box. So we have a crew of people that you'll see pop up on the video with um, some screens in front of them. And they're using some more advanced tools now to use uh, to command the robot. They're still having to use quite a few, um, we kind of think about it in mouse clicks, quite a few interactions with the robot to get it to do what it wants. But this was a much better way of doing things than we did it on orbit. So from there, we decided, OK, this is great, but we're going to need a lot more tools to really make this useful when we have the time delay, limited bandwidth, um, and there's a lot of stuff to be done, and we don't want a team of people watching this the whole time. So the tools that you saw that were mostly being used in that previous video were something called affordance templates. So what we've done is that our innovation is that we stuck the um, robot model and its frame of reference and its sensor data in the same kind of field or the same screen as models of the objects or interfaces that it needed to manipulate. And then we encoded those models with how you would visually place those in the robot's environment and also how a robot would approach these and manipulate it. So for the RFID scanner that it was using in the previous um, screen, 
there is a trigger on it. And so it's not just how do you go and grab it, but also how do you trigger the RFID reader to actually make it work. So we encode all of these things in these models. And then we can use those models to basically manipulate our environment. So the four different things that the robot accessed in the previous demonstration, each one of those had a model and the affordance templates. Then we found, well, it's cool to do that, but we don't want to have to tell a robot each and every model every single time another thing pops up what it needs to do. We'd like to be able to string these together into higher level tasks where I can say, go get that cargo bag for me, and it would know what to do. So then we developed something called Task Force, which was um, an interactive programming um, um, IDE, if you will, a, a, a development environment so that you could go in and string together different tasks, different um, routines that you might be doing. It doesn't have to be sequential. It can be branched. It can be based on data that's getting. It could be concurrent um, sorts of tasks that you're doing. So you could be trying to you know, put a bag into a, um, a stowage location. You're using your vision. You're using your force, your haptic sensing. And you're also using your affordance templates and your manipulation. You're doing all of these things at the same time. So this tool um, allows us to do all of those things in a very easy manner. And finally, Robots on their own are, are great and all, but wouldn't it be cool if the spacecraft itself could talk to the robot, tell it kind of what was going on with the spacecraft, and have this nice integrated system where you could do all of that together. So we're trying to develop a framework where we can put spacecraft subsystems, robots, um, processes like automated rendezvous and docking, as well as kind of an overall vehicle systems manager in the same um, framework that can talk to each other and be able to pass the information needed back and forth and do that without a whole lot of interaction from the ground. What the most important part for our purposes is that we have to make this something that's verifiable, that we know what's going to happen, that the command and control authority of the spacecraft is never in question, and we can understand, even if it's acting and deciding things on its own, that it's going to be doing the right things. And so our framework attempts to do that. Okay. So we've moved on from there. This is from about six months ago, and we've made the tools such that we basically can do this entire um, demonstration with very few interactions from the ground. And so um, to briefly talk about what we're doing, we're doing an autonomous logistics management. So we're in our same mock-up in our, our gravity offload facility. We're going to go over, we're going to open this hatch, and we're pretending like this is a logistics module that has come to the gateway around uh, the moon. And there's no Crew, crew on board, and we need to set up for the crew. And so we're going to go get into that logistics module and then start pulling out bags. And so this demonstration just shows that off. Um, there's a bunch of different like technologies that are flashing around the bottom. But really what I want you to look at is the, the guy who's in the upper left-hand corner. He's my robot operator. And if you, I mean, the robot's doing cool stuff, but every once in a while if you look over at him, he's kind of doing nothing. Like, he's kind of bored, he drinks his water, he looks around. Every once in a while, he's looking at his computer screen and doing a click here or there. But largely, he doesn't have to do a whole lot. Every once in a while, the robot will get to a point where it needs a little bit of help. Maybe it didn't quite find the bag the first time, or it's saying, I'm getting too much force on this, more force than I expect, and he has to kind of push the robot through that and, and, and um, use his higher level thinking skills to get to that point. But largely, the robot's able to decide these things on its own. And in fact, it doesn't just decide one thing to do and give up. It has um, uh, several things to do. For example, grabbing these handrails. There's three different ways that we approach grabbing the handrail before we ask for help, which is a huge help because we want this to be like an astronaut is doing this and that um, the robot will call down for help like astronauts call down for help when needed and to not bother with the small details. And so um, if you've been watching my operator up in the corner there, you know, he's just kind of hanging out. And so we've, we've, we call this a success. We've got more work to do, but it's, it's doing a pretty good job of, of figuring these things out all by, by itself. So he's about to go grab the bag, so I'm not going to like push through until, until he does it. But um, this bag collection part is, um, we have done it probably a hundred times in 90% of the time, 90 times out of the hundred, it takes one mouse click to say, oh, go get that bag. And in about 10 times out of every 100, we've had to give it a little bit of um, extra attention and help through that. There it goes. Okay, so why are we 
why am I here? What, what about energy? So we started doing this, and then we also talked to um, IBM Watson Labs up in Austin, Texas. We were interested in doing this connection with the spacecraft, and they've been interested in doing the same sorts of things with some of the, the technology that they've been developing. So we thought, wouldn't it be cool if we added a brain to our robot? Well, it, it so happened that they were working with this other customer that they thought had a really similar problem, and we, we think they do as well. So Woodside Energy is an Australian um, energy company. They're based out of Perth, and they have something they call not normally manned offshore platforms. So what they do is they come up with maintenance plans, and they have this offshore platform that instead of 100 people or whatever is usual, um, they have no one except for every 10 weeks they send out a crew of six on a helicopter to go do this, the planned maintenance uh, items that they, they have. Well, what they'd like to do is stop sending people out in between that 10 weeks to uh, unscrew a light bulb or to look around a corner that they don't quite have enough um, sensors to go see and understand why this one alarm's going off and those sorts of things. Um, so we thought that sounded an awful lot like our not always crude deep space habitats. And so we started talking more. I'm going to play this video. Um, it basically speaks for itself, so I'm going to be quiet for a minute. What's really exciting about coming into technology, a new part of the company, we really see that robotics could be used in many activities to be an assistant to our maintainers and our operators so that they can be removed from some of the more hazardous tasks and allow us to maintain and operate our facilities in a different manner. We're really interested in giving our robots the ability to think and learn on their own to be able to interact better with humans. So our Robonaut is a humanoid form. We've actually got over 300 requests from our operational staff on site to actually bring robots in to help them do a particular task that either is inefficient, it's repetitive, or there's some degree of risk associated with that. Okay, I'm ready. I am now isolating the drive. looking to push the boundaries of science both on and off of Earth. We're all about developing robots to work successfully and safely side by side with people. This collaboration is an excellent opportunity to do so. <laughs> that is cool. <laughs> God, so they were really interested. They kind of went from not really having much um, robotics knowledge, though they were very well versed in AI. They have several AIs that they've strung together to do um, a lot of help for a lot of different aspects of their business, from the production on their offshore platforms to being able to schedule leave in their, their you know, corporate systems. Um, but they were interested in what robots could do, and so they came to Johnson Space Center for three weeks. We took them from hero to zero, if you will. We taught them all that we knew. We gave them our tools. And by the end of those three weeks, the demonstration that you saw the robot doing, it was um, a high voltage switch, something that they don't generally like sending people to go uh, manipulate. They have to wear full PPE for. Uh, they had that demonstration done well enough within less than a week of work that they showed it to high level folks in their state government in Australia. So I think it was a really nice testament to the power of the tools that we've provided and, and, and how you, know, you could get people who are very smart but not necessarily highly trained in that area to do some really cool stuff. So that's been a really wonderful collaboration. And we're really interested in um, seeing kind of how that goes. So they're not going to tend send Robonaut out to their offshore platform or other things, but they're using Robonaut to learn about what they could do, what is possible with robotics today to do that. And in fact, they're doing site trials as we speak with other robots to understand the different types of use cases that they actually can put into the field today. So for um, us in, in space, I think our future exploration missions are presenting some really unprecedented challenges to what is possible with the autonomous systems that artificial intelligence and robotics we have right now. And I think they have really great parallels to what is happening in the energy industry as well, as well as other industries where you don't want to necessarily send people, but you want to have tools there that can give you the same sorts of abilities that a human body could while you have your brain someplace else. 
So we hope that um, as we're working and moving forward, we can find questions, um, answers to questions that we have, um, lots of things about what roles these technologies can play, what things can we have them do, how do we trust them, how do we have these systems earn enough trust that we're willing to send humans far away with these systems, um, inside these systems, and how do we design the system so that it can team with the people both on board and on the ground. Thank you. Thanks, Julia. Um, so if you've got questions for our speakers, um, uh.edu slash energy slash ask, uh, that gets us started. So second part of our Kahoot quiz. Uh, so we're gonna, gonna have it over the next three minutes. Um, hopefully we're gonna have no technology glitches. If you're ready to go, I think we need the code kahoot.com or kahoot.it and we can get started. If not, we should. We changed the, the AV room from here to there and that's uh, sort of sent us into, into a challenge with technology. So yeah, uh, Shannon, probably we should just skip the uh, Kahoot, let's go with Mickey um, uh, as our next speaker. Uh, Mickey Frisch uh, is, um, my sheet here, um, is a manager of industrial sensors at Physical Sciences, uh, and he's been doing some work on remote methane sensing along with one of my colleagues here, Nathan Natural Space Sciences, of Talbot, and this is really uh, cutting edge stuff in looking at how to detect methane, methane leakages, uh, and this is uh, a really uh, important environmental work that's ongoing. We ready? Well. <laughs> Good. Well, thanks for the introduction. And what I'm really here to talk about is the confluence of lasers and small drones. Um, small drones are otherwise known as unmanned aerial vehicles or unmanned aerial systems. And the, the technology that I'm talking about, yeah, yes, it's applied to energy and, and methane detection but it's also intended to advance, um, I'll call it the state of the art of autonomous measurement using drones and lasers to do things for natural gas um, leak detection that people can't do or cannot do practically. So bringing in these automated systems is something that we don't intend to replace people with but to do things that, that just uh, otherwise can't be done. So let me get into the talk, and I want to start off with some background. Let's make sure I can push the right button. Tell you about, a bit about who I am, and where, where I come from, and the history behind this, which will set the stage for the end of the talk, where I'll, I'll tell you where the, the robotics come in. First of all, the, the company I work for, Physical Sciences Incorporated, I, I've been there forever. The company is 45 years old, and I've been there for most of its, its life. Um, we're headquartered up in, in Andover, Massachusetts. We have um, eight outposts throughout the country, and I happen to be one of those outposts right now, um, living here in Houston for reasons that, that you'll hear about in a minute. Um, well, what do we do? We're, we're a contract research and development company. Most people don't even know what that means. Um, well, what it means is, is that we work um, much like a, a university in some sense, is that we contract with the government or, or private industry to do research and development. And, and our niche in, in the world is basically to take um, technologies that are emerging perhaps by re basic research from universities and turn them into practical applications. And sometimes what comes out of this are our products that we turn into um, sellable products and, and market them. 
through by ourselves or, or through others. And um, in the past, you know, about 25 years ago, we um, were the first people that took lasers and turned them into industrial quality um, instruments for continuously monitoring um, hazardous gases. And that's um, the, these devices shown up here on, on the open left. They're called open path laser sensors. And what they do is they basically project a laser beam, sort of like the, this red laser, which doesn't work. I'll show you another in a minute. Um, you, you've all seen la laser pointers. That sends a, a laser beam to a target in a, a distance and measures light that comes back from that laser beam. And it measures the amount of a target gas um, in between here and there over the path that the laser, laser follows. So we introduced that to the world about 25 years ago. It's now a, a worldwide industry that many people do this sort of thing. Um, but what evolved from that is this technology that's called the remote methane leak detector. And I happen to have one here with me. And this is a device that measures methane for natural gas leak detection. This evolved um, starting in about 2000 when a, a gentleman from a company that's just down the street from here, um, Heath Consultants, visited me in Andover and said, we're, we're the, the world's leading company for natural gas leak surveying. Now, everybody knows we have natural gas pipelines all over the place, and they leak, and we're required by regulations to search routinely for those leaks and um, fix them when, when they're found, and everything leaks. And so these consultants manufactured back in 2000 leak detection technology that was decades old and provide services for that. And they said to me, we want to change the industry. We want to bring lasers to leak detection. Work with us to make that happen. And we did. And the outcome was this device, the remote methane leak detector, which is now a, an industry standard product. And this is a laser-based product that just sends a laser beam. Um, I can, it's an infrared laser beam, but it has a green laser associated with it so we can know where the, where the laser is pointing. And it makes a lot of noise also sometimes. We can turn that off. But it's here to, to entertain you. What I've done is I've strategically located a bag of methane over here. And when I aim at it, you can hear that this picks it up, changes its sound, and lets me know that methane's there. So folks walk around with this all the time along the streets of New York, and it doesn't squeal like that. It just actually beeps um, when it finds methane. But that's what it does. So why am I telling you this is because we have now taken this and turned it into a device that flies on a small drone. The drone is actually sitting there on the table in the background. And we call that the RMLD UAV. So why do we do that? So here on my slides, you see the, the remote methane leak detector. Um, Skip back there. Another product that has come out of our, our research and development is the drone itself. We at PSI are, are drone manufacturers. We build them primarily for the, the military, but we've adapted them to this application. So we've done a lot of that work with the support of government agencies, and specifically the, the Department of Energy's Advanced Research Projects Agency, otherwise known as ARPA-E. Um, la last week, I was in Washington. ARPA-E has a, an annual technology summit um, where we have a, a booth and present the, our technology, and they have a, a number of speakers. Um, a surprise to us was that the um, President's Science Advisor was one of the keynote speakers. And he was giving a, a presentation about the, the value of RPE um, technology development 
and was focusing his speech on, on reducing regulations that inhibit the, the use of technologies. And he was specifically pointing out um, regulations that inhibit the use of drones for, for various applications. And he called up our technology as, as an example of something that has come out of the, the ARPA-E program and basically said, here is an example of a valuable technology that was called into use in the aftermath of Hurricane Harvey to go out and search for, for um, leakage in inaccessible areas that were flooded out. Um, here is our, our drone flying over Beaumont, Texas, um, looking for, for gas leakage um, in the area of that ship. And um, so, that's what this is all about, is, is bringing this stuff alive. So here I'm talking about, you know, wh why are we doing this? What, what's the problem? Well, there's natural gas lines, again, millions of, of miles of natural gas pipelines throughout the country. Um, the gas is extracted at, at wellheads, ga gathering fields, they're called. And um, all of these things have leaks or they emit. Now, natural gas is a safety hazard. That's why it's a, a problem on the, the streets of New York and every place else in the world, is you don't want to have explosions. Explosions sometimes happen. Um, you want to find leaks and, and fix them before they become a, a personal hazard, an explosion hazard. But more recently, I mean, that, that's been something that's been going on for 70, 80 years since gas has been here, you've got to look for, for leaks in municipalities. But more recently, with the, the advent of concern about climate change, it's recognized that natural gas, which is primarily methane, is a greenhouse gas. And so there is more of a, an urgency to find small leaks, um, even if they're not um, personal hazards if they're not explosion hazards, but they have become environmental hazards. And so there's been a, a, a push by the government and the industry to find these leaks and control, measure them and control them. And that's where ARPA-E project and other projects have come, in, come into play. And that's what we're working on. And one of the reasons, going back, is that um, these leaks are often difficult to detect. They come and go. At wellheads in particular, wellheads are not monitored by people. People go out there once every few months with survey equipment to see if there's any leaks going on. But we know that emissions from wellheads come and go. You'll miss them if you're not there at the right time. And so the technology that we're developing is specifically intended to sit at wellheads, for, st for starters at least, to sit at wellheads, continuously monitor to see if there is a leak. And if it detects a leak, send the drone up autonomously to fly around and find out where that leak is coming from and how big it is and report that information back to the operators so that the operator can then decide whether to, to go out and, and mitigate or, or not. So again, the technology is based on, on the remote methane leak detector. As I've described, you know, this is what we call backscatter tunable diode laser spectroscopy, but you don't need to know that. Um, it's a, a device, you know, it, it looks and surveys for, for leaks from about 100 feet, senses methane, methane only and there's thousands of them out there. And we've adapted it now to the, our, our small UAV. These are just some of the, the specs of, of the, the UAV. Um, uh, essentially, you know, the, the whole system detects methane. What it does is it has a, a small version of the remote methane leak detector that looks, looks down. So it flies on the, the bottom of the vehicle and uh, the vehicle flies about 30 feet above the ground and surveys the, the area of interest. And this is a vehicle that's intended for all weather operation. It, it can operate in, in significant winds. And it's intended for 
ultimately full autonomy, basically to, to fly by itself, take off and land all by itself under computer control. It's not there yet, we call it semi-autonomous. Semi um, regulations don't allow it to be fully autonomous, so we have to have a pilot in the loop when it's flying. So that's the state where we're at now. But it uses the, the data that it collects to change its flight path autonomously, and it has the capability to take off and land all by itself, and it can fly a, a complete pattern all by itself, but with a pilot there to make sure that it doesn't go out of control. So here's the, the type of things that, that we're doing with it. What you're looking at here is a, a test site looking down from above. These are actually um, satellite views of, of the test sites, which are, are simulated well pads. So these are, are about 30 feet square areas. And on the left-hand side, um, the black and white that you're seeing under the blue is some equipment that, that's on this well pad. Up in the, the upper left corner is a storage tank looking down from above. On the, the lower part of that is some other infrastructure. Over on the right, again, is, is also you know, just some, some pipeline infrastructure. And the color code in the blue is um, the methane that we measure with, with our, our sensor. So what we're doing is we're flying this UAV in the raster type pattern that's shown in the red, red lines and mapping out the methane um, that the laser is detecting below the flight path. And then we, we do some calculations that, that come out and give us this map, uh, the colorized map of the methane emissions. And what you can see on the left is that there's a, a leak at the, the top of that storage tank, the upper left-hand corner, the bright yellow, is the leak, which is basically blowing downwind to the, the, to the west, from the east to the west, the west is to the left, and that's why you see the colorization to the left. In the, the right-hand side picture, we, we've got a leak coming from um, that, that piece of infrastructure where, where there's the bright yellow, and it's blowing to the, to the northeast, and you can see a, an image of, of the plume that's blowing off of there. And we're able to essentially you know, take the, the information from there and calculate um, the leak rates. A lot of that calculation work has been done here at the University of Houston. We work with, with Bob Talbot and, and Lydia Yang, who are here in the audience, who have worked with us to, to do, do those calculations. And they're working out quite well. So where do we go with this? I sort of described the, the end game. Um, th this is a, a picture of our vision for how this is going to be deployed in the future, is that we'll have the, these vehicles um, installed permanently at, at wellheads and, and other sites, again, continuously monitoring for, for leaks, parked in a platform that's sort of shown on to the left, where we've got the, the vehicle that sits there, aims its laser beam through a hole in the bottom of, of a platform and by mirrors directs it along the, the um, perimeter of the well site. So if there's a leak there, the methane blows across the perimeter. Um, it picks it up just like one of the open path sensors that I described at the beginning of the talk. When it detects a leak, um, it commands the, the vehicle to take off and fly a pattern. Here I'm showing the pattern as, as a, a, a spiral. It can be you know, a raster scan type pattern like I showed before um, to map out the leak, quantify it, and tell, report where it's going. And that's basically it. I just close with a, a cute little movie that we can spend a minute and watch or not. This is just showing the, the vehicle doing a, a little dance at a, a test site that we have a little bit further down the road in Hitchcock, Texas, um, where we've been testing out the, the vehicle and, and doing all of our, our development. That's our test range. And this is flashy, and if we had sound, it has music that goes with it, but that's okay. You can just see it taking off and flying its patterns. And it also has cameras on it, so in the, the right-hand corner, you're getting the, the camera's view of, of what the vehicle is seeing. And if I could fast forward, I'd just get to the end, but I don't know if we can do that. <laughs>
see it landing in its, its pad in a moment. I guess while it finishes up, uh, I'll sit down and we can start getting the, the next speaker going. Terrific. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So David, um, David Reed is our final speaker. Um, David is the chief marketing officer at uh, NOV. And one of the things he, he's done, which is sort of uh, unique, he's founded the automation group for the Society of Petroleum Engineers. So sort of, he has really brought this field to the oil and gas industry. And I think um, his talk is just going to blow your mind off. So with that, David. Yeah. It's going to blow your mind <laughs> if you didn't hear that. So no big deal. Um, OK, so who here is human? Interesting, a lot of robots here. <laughs> Who's awake? Yeah, you robots, yeah. All right, very shy bunch. Just checking, seeing whether you're sleeping or not. OK, so good. It's late. Um, let's try and be entertaining. Uh, so I'm the chief marketing officer at National Oval Varco. Um, I started, I was an architect and um, designing houses in California, then back in Scotland and I kind of stumbled into the oil and gas business. The thing that really interested me in the business was the company I was interviewing with, which actually is the Varco part of National Oval Varco. They, um, they all had Mac computers. This is before we had Windows in the 90s, which was interesting to me for a company back in those days. And so all I wanted was to be able to have one. So that was my main question. Do I get one of these? Um, I'd never seen a white screen yet, so that was pretty exciting. I was like. Can I just have it? <laughs> so I could take it home. That was exciting. They also said you're going to have money so that you can buy a computer, because the company wants everyone to have a computer at home. So already I'm like, I kind of like you guys. This is 1992 when I started with the company. So I immediately learned that they made robots. So interestingly, back then, you may think you see all the things on television of what oil and gas is like. But in 92, um, we had our prototype robots out there. They'd actually bought a computer company to actually use solid state computing, which had not really existed yet. Uh, it didn't work, by the way. So two years on a drilling rig, and uh, that didn't work. So we went back in technology a little bit. But just so you know that since I started, I've been around the robots and the machines that we use on drilling rigs. So I'm going to share a bit about that story. So the future is good. So I'm a bit of a futurist, because um, I plan on being alive tomorrow. So that technically puts me in the futurist realm. That's why I'm interested in going forward. You know, anyway, not just comedy. And um, we'll do some other things as well. So the, uh, the future is really important for you to think about in that um, if you're uh, planning on being here tomorrow, it's good to actually plan on what might that be like and start thinking about what could the future be like. Because the good news about the future is it has not happened yet, unless you're a time traveler, which is different. OK. so. I'm going to talk a bit about ideation. This is kind of to describe the experience for me of getting on a drilling rig. These are uh, th uh, stands of drill pipe. It's about 100 feet in the air there. And we have a guy physically moving pipe. So when I uh, joined the industry, this was the majority of all drilling rigs. But we did have a machine. So that's interesting. So there was a machine we had that could do that work. But three guys would manhandle these, uh, these large, heavy drill pipes around. So I don't know if you see the guy up there, but that's, that's what he does. I don't know if you've seen video of that. Um, so it was very easy for me with an architectural background to go, come on now. Really? We're going to do this? We're going to have people moving very heavy pieces of steel around with their hands. So um, in the industry, I've spent a lot of time on, on getting us from this guy here on the left. I had to turn around to see it because, yeah on the left, and we're going to get to the robot. And so the, if, you, if you know about Sheridan's 10 laws, I'm going to explain them briefly, of uh, the states of automation. They're not laws. They're actually states. So the first is that the state where the human's in charge of everything, not really using a computer at all. A uh, computer exists, but not, not in the process. And then it goes up to 
a computer is offering a set of alternative choices, and then you look at a computer narrowing the selection and, and uh, saying, here's a few things you can choose, human. That's how they talk. Um, the computer suggests an alternative. Maybe you should do this. And then you go to the computer actually executing. Uh, if, the, if the human says it's OK, which is stage five, stage six, the human uh, allows, so the computer allows the human, so we start moving over into the computer control side, allows the human a restricted time to respond. I'm going to do this unless you stop me, kind of like a teenager. Um, <laughs> then you go to seven as, as the computer gets older. Uh, it starts executing automatically. And, you know, more like an older teenager, if, you know, if necessary, let the uh, human know. Uh, then you go on the computer informs only if asked, so now you're whatever age you were when you started doing that. Um, and then ultimately you get up to the computer is going to tell the human if he thinks, you know, that's the right thing to do. And then finally he's like, humans, who needs them? Okay. <laughs> So that's the progression, and it's interesting to understand where you are in the process. So uh, inside of oil and gas, we've been talking about where are we in the process. It's good to understand. So kind of, we've been going three, four, five in the last few years and really picking it up. And the reason we're picking it up isn't because we're particularly genius. It's because this stuff is available. The more that the low-cost technology is available, the more we're going to use it. So I'm going to give you a bit of idea of, of where we are. So this is the machines. So for me. Um, this is a big deal. So these big, uh, they range from about 100 feet to 140 feet robots. Um, I got to bring those into the industry. I was out in California working on these gigantic robots. And they're on, uh, at this stage, almost, well, I would say every single drilling rig that we built in the last 10 to 15 years. We have these giant robots that actually move around and get the pipe and they handle it. It's pretty normal uh, when you're offshore. And so you may not have known that. I thought it'd be good for you to know that we, we have that. But it was great to go from we've got to do something different to doing something different and seeing it happen in our industry. And now it's just a question of how much control do these machines have. Um, so control becomes really interesting. If we're, One thing we started, I think when I started, we were making these machines. Every time we built a drilling rig, I kind of loved it because we make a new machine. Um, I was a bit young in the business side and more fun on the engineering side. So every single drilling rig we built had a special machine where we'd go, you know what else we could do? That kind of worked every time. Seemed like a lot of fun. Uh, then it turned out that we didn't make money. So that's not a good thing after all. Um, so it turns out we're supposed to make money. We forgot. We were having fun. Um, and we started making these different robots. So I kind of backed off and said, OK, I found out what one of the problems is in this process. It's me. Um, so I need to get myself out. And we need to start building standards, or as it's called to most people boring. Um, so you know, when you're an engineer, you don't want standard. But standard is really healthy. And so we started moving to standard machines. And it turned out we made more money. Uh, that was good. Uh, we also started to understand that the systems should have some level of standard. Because something happened. It was about 2000. Um, and we were, we'd been building packages, and it had been painful. But we had these you know, computer-controlled, machine-driven systems. And um, we had Y2K. Does anyone? even know what that means. <laughs> There's some people know that's good. You can tell. You know, ask your grandparents. Um, the Y2K was a thing where the coding wasn't really planning on the turn of the century. I don't know what they thought. I mean, uh, mid-90s, does anyone know what Flight of the Concords means and the song Robots? Look it up. Um, <laughs> it's about the ro robotic you know, revolution where they take over the world. Uh, so uh, they were, everyone kind of thought that that wasn't going to happen when they were doing code. So here we go, and we tip over into the new millennia, and everyone was terrified that all computers were going to break down and fail. That was the, the basic idea. And it was Armageddon time. Everybody was right on the edge. I mean, lots of people in Houston had a lot of guns and food, um, which, you know, <laughs> isn't that just Houston? Anyway, so, um, but they were all getting ready for Armageddon. And so... <laughs> We, we were doing the design of a rig, and we started to get to this place. We were buying up different systems and putting them together and, and making these fantastic rigs. But what really dawned on us was there's these, these things are going to be connected, which is pretty smart, considering you know, we didn't know uh, exactly what we were saying. But we thought the machines are going to start talking to each other. They're going to need to all be the same. They're going to have the same language. They're going to have to be the same on the next rig. 
so that they can talk to each other. So I actually have a presentation from about 2001 where we sold our really first package. And the whole idea is it's about the software. Um, we didn't tell everyone after that because we liked the standards mostly because that meant money. Um, but what actually happened is we kept building more and more systems that were alike. And as we did, the ability to take controls through the spectrum and start giving more over to the uh, computing systems increased. And so uh, integration and standards became really critical for us uh, because if you make special things, if you can't find ways to do that in an efficient and cost-effective manner, um, it's going to hurt you. And also, the machines need to talk to each other. So the more you can repeat, the more they can learn from each other and be alike. Uh, it becomes a really good thing when you're, when you're building these systems. I have no clue what I was thinking when I made that slide. So let's just watch a video, shall we? OK, here's a guy. Can you hear him? Turn the volume up. I'm just kidding. There's no volume. <laughs> Just messing with the guys in the back. Um, this guy is talking to something. I don't know what. Um, no, this is showing the technology as we're going forward, the ability for people to actually look at the jobs they do and make it better. So we're actually using big data to calculate when things fail. So when the, we can understand the condition of something, we can actually predict when they fail. So you can see there's a lot of different machines that we've built across the drilling rig that allow us to actually bring a lot of value. And so when guys are interacting, using the technology that is readily available. We can start applying our smarts about the machine, connecting it with data scientists and looking at the predictive behavior. And suddenly, the whole system gets better. And what you learn about what is in the future is it's only here in the future if it's going to give us value. So in this case, we're able to tell someone you know, that a machine will fail. When a machine will fail, you can plan on it. Suddenly, the machine and the system can start ordering parts. It can start looking around the world to see if there are parts. It can tell uh, a system on the rig in the future, not now, in the future, it could build the part with 3D printing as that cost comes down. The potential for the systems to add value and do things, because today we have drilling rigs all over the world. And I, when I was first starting and working in the service part of our business, you noticed that we would use helicopters to fly small parts long distances when we were in trouble. So across the system, this is actually going into the production side with showing frac systems as well as the producing systems offshore. All of the systems have got computers in them and have had for some time, or they're just physical devices that we can actually measure the work that they're doing. And when we do that, we can actually gather all that data. And so for a long time, we had uh, a challenge where people thought we had too much data. Um, but really, then came big data just in time where we could start actually having uh, the ability to process all of it and know when we have failure, where we have failure, and start getting the systems to learn what failure looks like uh, and when it's coming. So then you get into performance. So that's great. We can keep machines up. Um, it was about seven or eight years ago, I think I was talking with our CEO and said, you know, we've got two problems in the future. Two of the products um, that we're going to have up ahead that will be a big deal are not machines. And uh, that was a challenge for us because we were machine makers. Um, and the two products were uptime, which I just showed you. And the second one is performance. And so we're going to start getting paid for these things. And this has happened with machine makers uh, all over the world as they've moved from having machines, looking after machines. And eventually, if they're high value machines, they end up really just selling things that keep them alive and getting paid for that. So performance is the second part of the picture that where the, the AI uh, and the robots start helping. So I'm going to show you. Uh, we have a lot of wells now. Um, that are actually going directional. And this happened with the shale revolution. It actually started before then offshore. But we started seeing um, the machine on top, which we were automating, and the machine below, which actually had computer systems in it. As it started to turn a corner, we started to learn how to turn inside of a well. So you've seen outer space. This is inner space that we play in. And so these machines have computers in them. And so this is what shale looks like. So we actually have to have enough smarts to say, oh, oh, I'm out of the shale. I've got to pull myself back. The system has to actually have a sensor system in it that knows where it is and starts looking at where it can go next. And so we start even having dysfunction in the well. You imagine we go for miles with these things. So when they start getting stuck, um, we start looking at, OK, how can we stop that? How can we get the system to actually drill a straighter hole in the well? So the smarts that we're being pushed into uh, really are to stop us having these very messy looking wells that you can see uh, there and actually getting the whole system to be focused on 
how do I drill a better straight well? And so this is actually a way of putting more speed so we use the fluid to go down and actually turn the rotary steerable in the well, which allows us to give more power um, at the bit. And then we've got actually a whole set of computers that are going to be streaming back. And we also have wired pipe now, which allows us to even signal the, the surface what's going on. So it's almost like we have a closed loop uh, going on. And what it does is causes us to drill smarter wells, better wells. And uh, they're, they're not just straight, but they're, they're costing less. They're drilling faster. So it gets very interesting that the business side starts driving us to a need so that we can produce better wells. But the shales have caused us to not only be able to access but to make better wells, make more quality wells. So that starts to be more valuable than the actual drilling that's going on because of the producibility. Change is a challenge. It's probably our biggest challenge if you wanted to ask questions about how do people adapt into new things. Um, that is one of the things that, that we struggle with. And so looking at how things are going to change, how people change, how to get people to opt into and understand technology um, is one of the things that we have ahead. So here's a classic example of change. We have traditional drillers today, and these guys are super capable, super smart, super connected to multiple processes. So they're, what they actually handle, there probably isn't another job in another industry that has someone with so much load on their back to manage. And the downside is everyone dies, right? You get it wrong, it's dangerous. And they care, so they're connected to people. There's so many things they do. So actually automation becomes almost a necessity for them. How can we take away the, the work that they're doing that is repetitive? And so we built a system that works a bit like an iPhone so that we can allow the machine to start repeating itself. And of course, what we learn, uh, we have a test facility up in Navasota. When we start running our drillers against the computer, of course, the, the computer is going faster, it's more consistent, um, it's doing better work. And so you can actually elevate the role of the driller. So the driller remains connected. And this is the second part, which is our wired pipe. And so this allows us to actually see in the well. For years, uh, we've been drilling blind, which meant you had to be really, really smart to calculate what's happening in the well. So we've actually created a data stream out of the well where we can have sensors up and down the well. This isn't science fiction. This is what we're doing now. Probably one of our strongest demand areas right now. So what that, what that means is the computing systems can work out themselves what is the best way to drill this well. So this is a system that's showing you there where it's actually looking for the most optimal drilling. And so here you see some of the top tier wells in the world, and then the, the machine that's repeating itself. And so not the best well, but certainly close to the best well repeated, which is high value. And when you get repetition in a business system and you get consistency, the backside of that is your whole supply chain can know when to turn up. So the waste factors um, mean that we're compelled. We're compelled towards these systems. So the rigs learn how to drill a well particularly well, and then, of course, you connect them on the cloud. And I don't know if that, that looks like something. Hmm. But it's a strange diagram. But what it does is starts getting them going up through satellites and checking with each other and saying, I've just drilled this section. This is what I've learned, and passing on that information. And that's really what machine learning is. I did this. It worked better this way. And so that allows the systems to connect. And so communication, learning, uh, to, learning with people how to use the systems, how it's improving their work. We do a lot of that, where it's teaching people this is actually taking stress away from you. It's helping you to perform better. Uh, and learning how to do that and how the machines can communicate amongst themselves. So you imagine we drill these wells. Uh, we have to produce them as well. And so we're going to show a little bit of uh, the connection between the work that we're doing drilling, which sometimes all companies get caught in. I'm a drilling department. I'm a completions department. I'm a production department. And even the, the mismatch of those goals to the end goal of producing better oil and gas becomes an issue. So if you look here, I'm just going to show you various things that happen after we've drilled the well. In this case, they're, uh, they're, they're opening up the well so that we can frack it. And they're going to put the pressure in. You're going to be able to see that uh, they'll take zones. And that ball actually holds in so we can take a zone and actually apply the pressure to frack the rock. And, and what that means is suddenly we're going to have this system. So this is the place we talk to NASA and other space areas where it's interesting of how can we map what it's actually done when we've done that. So there's more to come. And whether that's nano or not, I don't know. But there's, there's some sensing challenges for us in the Earth. But when you look at what we're doing, all of this relates in that the kind of well that you've drilled relates to the production or relates to what you already know about where the well is, and then knowing when you frack it what is, what is happening. So there's so much more 
that we look at that we need to do, and it gets very interesting for us. So finally, keep it real. So sometimes we say all these things, and I'll, I'll get excited about it and project some really nice animations. But uh, in reality, we're, we're still back at four to five in, in this scale. And the systems aren't reliable enough yet. They aren't there. We are applying them, but there's so much more to do. And I say that to make it exciting for you guys, because there's so much need in our space to continue advancing. I also wanted to encourage you that we've been doing this for a while. We've been playing in this space. And we're using advanced robotics, and we're right at the front edge of what's happening. And it feels really slow to me sometimes. But in reality, we have to remember that we're, we're doing some really cool stuff, and there's a lot of uh, applications for robotics and AI ahead that really aren't like we hope. Uh, it's just coming. It's coming our way, and, and that's what our future looks like. Thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, that was tremendous. We are, I think, way over time, but we, in the interest of the many, many questions that have come in, I'm going to try and condense this to a few short questions, and then uh, we'll open it up with the reception where you can engage with our speakers. So this is a question for all of you on the panel. You've shown us great examples of what can be done. What are the challenges? How do we get to 10 on that scale? Rashid, you want to start? Yeah, I think uh, one of the biggest challenges is uh, the availability of skills. I think uh, earlier I was talking about the number of open roles. So there is a, a large effort needed in, uh, in that space, I think. Um, I think that um, the human interaction with these systems is one of the bigger things. Um, just understanding when you have one of these systems, you're working with them, you're right next to them. How do you understand what it's thinking? How do you be able to give the trust to that system? And they're seeing this kind of with autonomous cars right now. How do you test all the different possibilities that are out there so that you feel like you can put your family in the system? I think both are relevant. People that can move these technologies forward and the time that it takes to develop them, test them, get them out there, prove them, make them reliable in, in real-world operations? Um, I would say that it, there is no desire to get to 10 on the scale. Um, it's, it's the wrong question. That, that's the fun question. The business question is, um, where is the value now that we can rely on, and how do we apply it? And then the question would be, um, how do we deal with change in human beings, the human beings accepting and relying and trusting the systems? And that, that's more the scale that's more valuable. Can the technology do it? Um, you have to ask why. Is it going to add? When you understand the value case, then yeah, it, it gets adapted and, uh, and adopted very quickly. So, you know, Great answers. Um, you know, one of the things that Julia just mentioned is, is something that I think being at a university, being at, in a place where we've got lots of students, how do we build that skill set? Have you given it thought? Have you, from your experience, what are the major pain points or pressure points that we have got to change that can start to bring the right people with the right skill sets to the various industries here? Can I take that? We, we have a um, robotics thing that came out of the automation section at the SP, where we actually have students compete around the world at doing autonomous drilling. Um, so what that does is proves the point. And, the, and they prove that it's possible. So when they go into work in a drilling department, they'll say that's not possible. So we're actually taking the block away within the students and giving them the drive. And what they're doing is doing something that I think is a, a challenge for us going forward, is they're sharing their data. Every year as they learn, they're sharing it with each other. So that rapid learning is, what is, is, is one of the things that people can learn. How do I bring that into business? Because we don't share easily in business, but certainly, um, getting these students to learn how to collaborate, how to learn from each other, and openly share their learnings causes a, a rapid progression forward. So I think, I think that's a good, a good approach. Um, I think that we as people have expectations when we hear about a robot or an autonomous system or an artificial intelligence, and we tend to assign more capabilities to that system than you might think. I mean, like the robot videos I showed, I like the one where it opens the hatch because it almost looks like 
robots should just do that, right? But it was extremely hard to get to that point. So I think we need to do a better job of calibrating everybody's expectations and understanding what is capable. And once we do that, then we'll get the skills and we'll get these applied in the right way. Yeah, and I think there's two levels of this that's needed, right? There's people who are actually building and operating this, and then there's everybody else who have to work around this. And I think as the world is getting more technical, some of that uh, education and knowledge start needs to get filtered into whole populations, right? And if you look at what the United Arab Emirates did, they uh, appointed a minister of artificial intelligence to the government cabinet. Uh, they set up a university with Google to train uh, all their college students on machine learning and AI. And now they're trying to build something for uh, high school kids. It, and, and that feels, I mean, that's very aggressive uh, in terms of that process. But those kinds of things are things we should be thinking about. Nikki? Well, one thing that I, I think is missing at many universities these days is cross-disciplinary um, education. Is students can be trained in robotics, but don't understand the applications of the robotics. I'd be hard pressed to find a, a student that understands combinations of, of lasers and, and robotics without many years of experience. So how one becomes less compartmentalized, especially at, at the, the undergraduate level, I think is, is a challenge for universities. Well, thank you. Um, before we close, I want to just give an opportunity to the, our panelists, if you have any closing thoughts on, on, the, on what you've heard, what you think are next big challenges. Rashid? I think the future is exciting. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Hopefully there's robots there. <laughs> <laughs> Mickey? Ditto. <laughs> David? I think, uh, I think use your imagination and apply it and, and drive towards it. I think there's so much value you can come in. You come in with a, a lack of fear uh, that we've all had as we were going forward because you, you're used to technologies now. Um, you've never known the world without them, and so I think there's a lot to add. So I think it's an exciting future for everybody here. Great. Thank you so much, David. Um, we've got more than 50 questions here. I certainly have not done justice to most of those. Um, I encourage you to stay here. We're going to have a reception. Uh, talk to the speakers. I think they've got a wealth of information that they can share with you. I um, want to, uh, again, thank our uh, fantastic sponsors uh, who've helped us put these events together. I want to thank you all for being a part of uh, this um, uh, this exciting panel here today. Uh, in spite of some of the technology challenges we've had, uh, hopefully AI will help us, but, uh, but we're, we're, we're certainly are very glad that you stayed around and were part of this conversation. I um, want to thank our Energy Coalition students for all the help that they've provided. And before we leave, um, we, uh, previously we had a, uh, a competition for our students, um, and we had a scholarship uh, that one of our previous speakers had uh, provided uh, for, for our students. And we had a competition, and we have two students who were winners of that. Um, I believe I want to make sure that they do flash the names here. Um, Joanne Ma, uh, and she's not here, and Esther Ventura, who is sitting right here, uh, is uh, one of the winners of the Michael Scali STEM scholarship. So, congratulations, Esther. Um, so with that, I, I want to invite you to our reception next door. Uh, please stay and join us. I also would like to make a pitch to you to give us ideas for next year's symposium. Uh, for we, we plan to run another four symposia on cutting edge topics. We are looking for uh, suggestions for topics and speakers and moderators. Uh, and so, uh, so certainly, uh, please provide those. We really would love to get those from you. With that, uh, thank you so much for being here. Uh, look forward to seeing you all back here in September. Thanks. Thank you.